Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, today I would like to talk about the um, model of atom developed by Niels Bohr, very famous physicist. He lived in Copenhagen. Um, actually, I was once in Copenhagen and I saw the house where he lived. Um, okay, so um, this lecture is part of the course called um, Physics for Teens, presented on Unizor.com. Um, the website Unizor.com is totally free and it contains other courses as well. Math for Teens, for his, uh, which is a prerequisite, pre prerequisite for this course, and some others. Um, I do suggest you to watch the lecture from the website because every lecture has notes very detailed notes like a textbook so you have a video and you have basically the same explanation but in a more like textual format okay <coughs> now the Bohr's model of atom has uh, been developed based on whatever the previous knowledge um, uh, was about it primarily the planetary model of Rutherford which we talked about before. Um, so Bohr and other physicists, obviously, <coughs> saw the problems with um, planetary model as it was presented by Rutherford. Now, what was the problem? Well, the first problem was, you see, atom uh, and el uh, contains uh, nucleus and electrons which are uh, rotating around nucleus. That's the pla classic planetary model of Rutherford, which he came up with because he saw that atom is practically empty. The particles can bombard it and go through the atom, so atom cannot be um, like a uh, plum pudding, if you remember. That was the earliest model. So, um, now, the, when the electrons are rotating around um, the nucleus, they um, must be under certain um, force, which forces them to go around the nucleus. And whenever you have something like a circular orbit, you have centripetal acceleration. So, the force between the nucleus and the atom. Nucleus is positively charged. Um, uh, electron is negatively charged. So this force of attraction makes electron to accelerate centripetally. Accelerated electron, according to a classical theory of electromagnetism, must emit electromagnetic waves, oscillations of electromagnetic field. Um, now, but if that's the true, now the electron is supposed to have certain energy if it rotates in certain um, radius. And whenever the energy is lost, the electron must actually get closer to the nucleus and eventually it will fall. So as it rotates, it's supposed to emit uh, electromagnetic oscillations all the time and lose energy and eventually reduce this orbit and fall. Which is obviously not the case because, uh, I mean, that would destroy the, <coughs> destroy the structure of the, um, of the matter, basically. <coughs> okay, <coughs> so we needed to uh, correct this planetary model, not, not to completely reject it, not at all, because really the structure of nucleus and electrons around it was kind of beneficiary for, for, the, physic, for the physics. It looks like it experimentally was proven. So how can we improve this? Well, so the one problem is <clears throat> that electron would lose the energy and fall on the nucleus, which is not the case. There is another problem. Now, if electron is just floating on any orbit whatsoever, then 
it must actually move from one orbit to another if we give some energy boost to an electron which should go to a higher more energetic um, orbit or if it loses energy it will uh, emit certain um, electromagnetic oscillations of certain wavelengths now if that's basically the case and that's it there is no there are no other rules so to speak then um, if we will supply energy to um, let's say hydrogen atom uh, the electrons will move from one orbit to another emitting certain light if they go from higher to lower orbit so we first give some energy they move to a higher orbit electrons and then and then after we move after we give more energy they cannot move any further so they will spontaneously move down and emit certain amount of electricity certain amount of um, energy in the uh, in the way of electromagnetic oscillations so we will see some light which is true we do i mean whenever we have something like a tube with hydrogen and we put some uh, electrodes in it and supply some energy after a certain amount of time the tube will start uh, emitting um, light but the light which it will be emitted um, would would have a continuous spectrum so to speak so if you will go uh, with this light through a prism it will give all the different colors without any kind of a you know preference or whatever which contradicted a uh, different set, sets of experiments um, experiments which were analyzing the spe spectrum of the light emitted by uh, let's say hydrogen now the spectrum <coughs> was not continuous there were distinct separate lines uh, which basically sign uh, specific for for hydrogen atom and let's say for some atom gas for, for some atoms of another gas it was different um, items but still distinct separate uh, monochromatic lines in the spectrum specific for each particular element so that cannot be explained by uh, plain planetary model as it was suggested by Rutherford so Bohr has suggested certain things I mean it was not like theoretically um, derived from certain other principles um, uh, so let me just suggest what, what Bohr suggested so first of all he suggested that there are certain orbits for each element its own set of orbits which he called stationary now being on a stationary model uh, being on a stationary orbit or within a stationary shell because we are talking about three-dimensional um, world so within this stationary shell electron is rotating or doing something whatever it's doing on this on this orbit or within the, its shell but it does not emit elect, uh, an energy don't ask why it just does not basically that's it that's a suggestion it's a hypothesis so now that's number one number two when it jumps from one stationary orbit to another it cannot be on any other orbit but on stationary and when it jumps from one stationary orbit to another it either uh, emits electricity if it's from a higher orbit to a lower or consumes certain amount of electricity whenever a uh, certain amount of energy I should say when it goes from a lower orbit to a higher orbit so that's basically so if this is the nucleus these are stationary orbits so whenever it jumps from here to here it's supposed to consume certain quant quantum of uh, energy if it goes from here to here it emits it now there are other so it can jump from here to here let's say then amount of energy would be equal to the difference between the energy level so energy high that's the energy of the 
um, energy level on a higher orbit minus energy low when it moves from higher to low is equal to amount of energy emitted by this particular um, jump and now we are going into some kind of a theory which was developed before by Max Planck and then used uh, by Einstein in um, uh, photoelectricity effect it's equal to H times um, frequency of light emitted and this is Planck's constant so whenever it moves from energy level to energy level it emits light of this particular frequency frequency is equal 1 over period and period is equal to uh, <coughs> lambda divided by C, right? C is speed of light, lambda is wavelength so this is basically its frequency, this is the period, this is the wavelength and this is the speed okay so that was a proposition that that's not it it was another proposition which uh, Bohr made and this would uh, I'll, I'll just put it as textbooks usually uh, presented and I don't like it at all however that's how it is presented by uh, textbooks he suggested that um, there is something which is called angular moment of of the electron it's basically mass of electron times its speed times radius of its orbit its angular momentum now I think angular momentum was actually addressed in um, uh, mechanics part of this course but regardless so this is angular momentum so he suggested that angular momentum must be equal to and that's so called quant quantization quant Quantization, whatever, quantization of angular momentum. It's supposed to be equal to n, which is some positive integer number, times um, so called reduced Planck constant, which is Planck divided by 2 pi. <coughs> now, that is a very, very important um, uh, e equality, whatever. Uh, which Bohr came up with but just as it is it just quite frankly I cannot understand how the person can come up with this particular hypothesis um, it just doesn't seem to be natural well apparently he had some other things and um, there are certain um, suggestions how exactly he came up with this but eventually he came up with this so um, he uh, postulated the quantization of angular momentum of the electron. That's what it is. Now, um, contemporary, um, well, not even contemporary, like 1920s approximately, um, level of physics allowed to come up with this particular equality slightly differently and again I'm not suggesting this was a like rigorous proof rigorousness is not really something which physicists are very comfortable with usually they they allow themselves not exactly the rigorous derivation and um, I will present how this can actually be derived from uh, more I would say fundamental principles uh, like theory of relativity and uh, quantum uh, theory so here is what was basically presented in one of the sources which I was using some time ago as again I, I should not say a proof of this formula but at least some explanation of this first of all we know the most famous formula of physics energy is equal to mass times um, uh, speed of light square that's the full energy of basically anything okay that, so that's one thing on another thing <coughs> we know that if you have a quantum of light let's say 
then it bears certain amount of energy equal to Planck's constant times frequency of this light, right? So, equating these two things um, results in the following. So, H, now frequency is, as I was just saying before, it's speed divided by wavelengths. Why? Because wavelengths divided by speed is the time um, this particular uh, thing moves for one wave, which is a period, and frequency is a reverse inverse of period. Okay. Now, so that's one thing. Now, um, from this we see what mc squared equals to this. We can reduce the c, so mc is equal to h divided by lambda. Okay. Now, on another hand, let's talk about lambda. You see, that's a very interesting explanation which was actually presented by De Broglie in 1924, probably. He has uh, suggested that electron on the on the orbit is somehow analogous to a string fixed on, uh, on both sides. Now, when we pluck the string, it starts vibrating, right? Now, what kind of vibration uh, this particular string can have? Well, it can have this one. It also can have something which is called standing wave. When part of string goes up and then down, and the middle part, so it goes either this way or this way. So it, it, it goes with this, with this middle part um, basically standing still. That's why it's called standing wave. Now, it can be divided in like four, let's say, pieces. Then it will be like this. So in any case, the length of the string should be equal to n times wavelengths, where n is a positive integer number. Now, uh, well, actually, I think divided by 2 even, because we can have only one half of the wave. But in any case, when this particular equation, when the equal, when, when the integer number of uh, wavelengths can be um, uh, put into this length, then you will have um, the, the real oscillation and the real sound from this string. Because if it's not, then the waves which are reflected from both sides would um, interfere, negatively interfere with each other, and there will be no uh, distinct note which can be basically obtained from this. That's very important. And de Broglie has suggested that if this is the radius, then 2 pi radius, which is the length of this, which, we, which he has suggested should be equivalent to a string, should be equal to n times lambda, where lambda is the wavelengths of electron considered as a wave. Again, there's this duality between the waves and the particles. What is electron? Is it a particle or is it a wave? Well, contemporary view is that sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. Whether you like it or not, I don't, but nothing you can do about it. It looks like these are theories which have been experimentally confirmed to like uh, 10 to the minus 8 or minus 10 degree in any kind of a unit of measurements. Um, so <coughs> if theory corresponds to experiment we have nothing to do but accept this theory at least for a while until the next experiment will contradict it. So if this is the case then this is the case. H divided by lambda is what? 2 pi r. 2 pi r. And n goes here. And that's it.
because if r goes here, m times c times r is equal to n times h uh, divided by 2 pi. Now this is angular momentum. h divided by 2 pi uh, usually is used as a reduced Planck constant. And we basically have derived with the same um, uh, uh, proposition of uh, Niels Bohr that um, angular momentum of the electron is supposed to be an integer number of um, reduced Planck constant. Do not consider this as a strict proof, pr proof um, rigorous proof. It, it's not, basically. But it's certain way which may be in certain more, you know, more developed theory can be considered as such. I didn't want you to really like consider this to be the, the last like word in this particular thing. Not at all. But anyway, it gives you that there is some logic in it. So the quantization of angular momentum suggested by Niels Bohr did have some very important um, theoretical um, foundation behind it. And that's it for atoms, which, um, atoms model which was developed by Niels Bohr. So he was a very interesting uh, physicist. Uh, he uh, left um, Copenhagen when uh, the Nazi came to uh, to the country, and there is a, some kind of a uh, interesting story about Bohr's um, gold medal. I think it was a gold medal, medal which he has received as a Nobel Prize. I'm, I'm not really sure. Some kind of gold medal, medal, which uh, he wanted to take with him and. Uh, he um, mm, he was told that the gold cannot be just brought through the uh, through the border or something like that, and he dissolved it in some kind of a gold can be dissolved in some liquid, some some acid or combination of acids, whatever, and then somehow restored it back. I don't remember the whole story, and I'm not sure it's even true. But anyway, it was a very interesting um, physicist and very famous, actually, physicist. All right, so that's it for a um, model built by Bohr. Uh, it brings us to, you know, not to contemporary, not at all, but to a level of 1920, something like this. Uh, but obviously, we did not address the two fundamental things which we were using here, which is theory of relativity, which is this one and quantum theory, which is this one. So uh, we did not touch this. It's completely outside of this particular course, which I called Physics for Teens. So this is not for teens. This is for older audience. But in any case, we'll see. Uh, that's it for today. I would suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. So you go to unisor.com. Physics for Teens is a course. Uh, it has a part called Atoms. And we're talking right now about the uh, chapter called Building Bricks of B Building Bricks of Model of Matter, sorry. Building Bricks of Matter, I think that's how I called it. And then there is this Bohr's atom model. That's it, thank you very much and good luck. <laughs>